don't want me playing the congas, conganistas. Hey, thanks for coming tonight. Uh, welcome, and uh, glad that you're here. Thank you, Lord, for uh, the great weather we've been having and everything in that regard, and thank you even more for our salvation, right? And along with it, the other benefits that we reap, along with the family of God together, and I pray that you're catching the wave because I think there's a wave of momentum taking place, and we thank all those that are praying for our church. Uh, please don't let up now. Let's go ahead and continue that we max out while we've got time, while we've got freedom, while we've got what we've got to be able to touch as many souls as we can for the Lord and doing it in the genuine way. And by genuine, what I mean is it's just uh, not because of how good we are, but how great God is and recognizing that in the same way that we know we needed a Savior, so is everybody else. But it's not having to convince them of that near, usually. It's just a matter of living in such a way that your light shines into their life and their darkness to the point that they go, man, I either need to get right with God or I get away from you, one or the other. But if we're just like them, there won't be any reaction to it. We just stay chums and buddies, and then we pat each other on the back and go, man, see you in heaven. Uh, because, well, we're good, you know, and it's like, no, man, Jesus is great. So uh, let's share Christ with those we can. That's the idea in the work of the church. Before we read, let's pray, if you will. God and Father, tonight I just humbly bow for another opportunity to not just to preach greater than that, Lord, just to be with my family. And just that magnificent, uh, unbelievable, miraculous thing that happens and takes place that, God, when we gather together, um, truly the devil is lessened. And I don't mean by that that, Lord, he's not and won't try to interfere with our thoughts or distractions tonight. But God and Father, I just thank you that he is so much less than what he is when I'm by myself. Maybe that's my fault, Lord, but I feel as a whole, it's just the uh, presence of you magnified through the hearts of believers. And that, God, that if nothing else, that, man, sometimes we'd want to, like an oasis, to come running to, to be together. Because, God, it just, it really is. It's so different how uh, everything from the temptations that flee and don't buzz around us like gnats or mosquitoes or whatever. But, God, on top of that, then, that uh, we also receive the blessing, God, of it's just like your word suddenly starts to make more sense and songs that are just songs suddenly become worship because we put our heart into it and we sing about you and unto you. And God, it's just because of the fact that you designed us for this. In fact, the whole harmony of the Garden of Eden and the world and entire solar system at that time had to have been phenomenal. The animal life and the plant life and everything that was uh, placed here by you and uh, until sin came in. And once the devil got his foot inside the door, Lord, from there on, it seems like everything else broke loose. Tonight, might we break loose, Lord, with you? Might we break loose as a church? And not because of uh, anything that we, so to speak, try, other than, Lord, we, if we're going to try anything. Let's just try to see if we can get closer to you. And in doing so, God, that we would reap also the benefits then, as what the scriptures tonight say, that lead to holiness. So, Lord, we bow before you and ask that you would speak to us. God and Father, I pray you'd give me voice. Thank you that it's not sore, don't know anything that's wrong with me, anything that way, just laryngitis stuff going on. But I pray you'd give me a voice, Lord, uh, not so that I'd sound good, but rather so that you could be heard. I pray that you would speak through my mouth in spite of me, that you would show your strength in the midst of my weakness in more ways than one, that you would show your power, your awesomeness, your holiness, Lord, in the midst of my lack. But yet, Jesus, I thank you for you and your grace that more than make up the difference. And I just pray that I would allow you and the Holy Spirit to work in my life the way you want to, but not only mine, but my brothers and sisters here and the Christians around the world. Bless those that, Lord, are far worse shape in many regards than we are tonight, those that are hungry, thirsting, those that are imprisoned. But we pray that while we're not, that we would still sympathize and pray for, but we also, Lord, would, would take our freedom, not for granted, but rather instead to take advantage of it, all for your, your kingdom and for your glory. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. So we left off last week here in Hebrews chapter 12, and just trying to sum up and put together from the faithful walk of those that were faithful to then beginning to understand about how we can build our faithfulness and to keep going and not give up is basically what this writer is saying here. But he gives us some clues in that regard. And basically he's saying that we stay in the race, whether you know it or not, there's a race that you're running. And the race that we ought to be running is a race that God has marked out for us. It's the one that he charted for our life. We know what that beginning date was. Most of you know what family you grew up in. Some don't. Uh, you know what area you grew up in. You know whatever you've been through to this point in time. And as I was down at the funeral home tonight with a family that just lost uh, um, their mother, 
um, 54 years old or young, however you want to look at it, you know, and uh, very sudden, I mean, nothing wrong, just all of a sudden it's over. Um, you can't predict those things. You don't understand. And yet I know of other people that I've spent time with at their bedside that they didn't understand why is God keeping me here? And I think that we probably all run the gamut with uh, various feelings that we have in regard to what am I doing here to I just wish I wasn't here to maybe you even yelled at your mom and dad one time. Why did you even let me be born? You know, and it's kind of like there's places in the Bible that those similar things were were cried out. And within it, uh, the obvious is this, that God obviously loves us, that he did birth us into this world. He gave us life and that he we would experience uh, not only this flesh life, but we'd find out that we needed and wanted eternal life and, and a God-given life that will last forever and ever. And so this is just a part of the journey. In the same way our kids started school a month ago, uh, we started school whenever we were born. And some people learn and some people don't. And some people use it to begin to discover God and in awe of God, and other people just wonder where in the world God's at. And it's sad because he's there for all of us. So this writer is trying to tell the people, man, since you've got the real God, the personable God, since you've got through Jesus Christ complete access to God as your father, man, maximize it. It's not a time to lose track of his voice. If you go back and reread Hebrews again, he said, if you hear his voice, listen. You know, so don't lose track of it, and whether it's the written word or whether it's the spirit speaking to us, that uh, whether it's things that the devil's trying to do to you know, present God in a way we'll resent God is typically how he works that we still would go ahead and hold out to God and hold on to God. But it's not just so we get by and get through it or so that we can have a nice life here if we play our cards right and we retire with great wealth and we can travel the world and all that. That's not the goal. The goal is so that we can honor God with everything we've got. The one who died for us, we live dying for him, right? And so that's the picture of this. And it's basically an emphasis, a reminder again and again, don't be like the children of old, the children of Israel of old, who although God was with them, that they went ahead and did their own thing and were faithless instead of being faithful. And uh, in doing so then, he says, so I want you to stay in the race. I want you to run the race that's marked out for you. I want you to focus on the coach, Jesus Christ, who wasn't only a coach, but he was a runner as well, and see what he did and what he did for you. Now you do back for him. He tells us then, as we looked last week, that we should continue to work out our salvation, more or less, work out that what we've got so that we can strengthen our weak knees and feeble bodies uh, our mentality, our attitude, everything needs to continue to work out that we would grow, increase in endurance and in strength and in attitude. And then uh, what we closed off with here is Hebrews chapter 12, then in verse 12, and verse, uh, finishing up verse 12 and 13, finishing up this segment before we go to the next paragraph. He says, therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and your weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. And so that's his encouragement to us. But strengthen yourself. So that you can in turn what? Strengthen others. And, uh, you know, in observing church, also being a Christian, a part of it, thinking at one time as a kid, you know, it was that thing you had to do. We had to go to church. And uh, dad would try to convince us, no, you get to go, but you don't have a choice in it. Uh, you get to go to church. That uh, I thought that that was what the deal was, was just kind of that. As time began to build, I still felt it was about the going thing, but, you know, I realized that there were a lot of things that I didn't know and that the scriptures were written down so that I could increase or improve my life. Not that I could be more saved. It wasn't that at all, but I would take that salvation and as what Paul told the Philippians to work it out, you know, kind of like what this writer here is saying, basically meaning now that you've got salvation, you've tasted and seen how good it is, take it all the way and let it be a part of your life. And then it became that thing that I was convinced that I was also supposed to use my salvation to help save others. And uh, not meaning that I could personally save anybody, but I could talk to people about God and Christ, live an example, follow that example up with not only the deed, but then the word behind it. And that, um, you know, I had the privilege because of a minister that was very close to me and a friend that um, he put it on my heart. And most of you know, I uh, baptized in one of my friends from, from school. And it was a uh, we changed districts. So it was just the first year of even being in that district. I was in the eighth grade in that summer of eighth grade year. Um, got the chance, the opportunity to baptize Kurt. And uh, in doing so, uh, Max's main thing to me was, well, you're the one that taught him about Christ by his own words. And so why don't you bring him into this next step of his relationship with Christ? And that was pretty awesome in that way. And uh, there was 
probably that little thing that went through my mind going, well, good. Now, finally, each one win one. I got my one out of the way. Let's go on, you know. And, but it wasn't something that I set out and tried to do. It was something that became or happened as a result of rather instead what I tried to do was to realize that I could either let my Christianity be a religion that was a Sunday only and a Wednesday night thing, or I could let it become my lifestyle. And I certainly still have a lot of room for improvement in every bit of my lifestyle. But that whole compelling nature is I've asked God, please don't ever let me quit or lose this desire to see other people get to know him. I ask for your prayers tomorrow for this funeral because uh, there are a lot of people that go to funerals. It's about the closest they get to God with their everyday life, the closest thing they have to coming to a church. And I just ask that you would uh, pray that I would, again, have God's word and not only the words, the right words to say, but speaking them in a way that hearts that are broken, that seeds can fall in. And again, it's not because I can save anybody, but the combination of the one-two punch of various things going on in people's lives or seeds that were planted years ago that might come to sprout tomorrow. But I just ask that you would do so. But every one of us, folks, as we get up, as I get up in the morning or when I'm still laying in bed looking up, it's like, okay, God, I thank you that uh, because of others, my parents, Sunday school teachers, and who knows who before that, missionaries and all, and those pilgrims that came across on the Mayflower and other boats, that I get, got to know you. So I know I'm saved, and I try to look at my life and say, God, is there something that you see? Like David invites the Lord and says, examine me, or not examine me, but he says, search me, O Lord, which is basically an examination. He says, see if there's any offensive way in me. Is there anything that God, that's of my mind, my heart, my soul, or my lifestyle that is offensive to you? And uh, David does that in a way because he wants to get those things out of the way to have a pure and open relationship with God. And so I'll begin my day in like that. And then what I go to next is, okay, and you've given me another life throughout the night when I didn't have to struggle for breath or try to, uh, uh, other than when Julie would roll over in that midnight or mid deal, whatever you turn and you, <sighs> oh, you know, then, uh, thought I was dying once, but uh, it wasn't. And uh, so you made it through the night. Why? Because I'm a good guy. Why? Because you want me to have fun today? And I don't think God's against fun at all. But no, there's one primary reason to still be alive, and that's to, if you aren't right with God, to get right with him. If you are right, it's what? Get somebody else right. And to help that in that regard. So look for somebody to serve. Anyway, that's what this is talking about, believe it or not. That if we just become selfish with it, and it's all about me, or all about me being saved, and I don't care about anybody else, and you can do that with your life. It's just you're not going to see much reward at the end if I read 1 Corinthians 3 correctly. But what this writer is saying is, man, no, max it out. Do all that you can do with it. I mean, it's, it's like me with every car, every motorcycle I ever had. you got to wring that thing out, you know, find out what it will do. Well, that we're to take this salvation. We're to live it out. We're to take this relationship with God and live it out full speed. And I don't mean there's not times that we pause and reflect like the sea law and the Psalms. But man, I think so many times when it comes to our Christianity, we're really low-keyed about it, almost maybe too low-keyed, because I don't think that we are enough on fire that anybody even comes to look to see what's causing us to smoke. And what we're supposed to be is so alive with Christ, it's like the, the disciples and the apostles that followed him, man. They wondered what made these guys tick, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. They couldn't help but miss, they couldn't miss it, that they'd been with Jesus, and they weren't afraid of anything. So might we reflect that with our lives, and especially as the days grow darker in that regard. So let's go on then. So strengthen your feeble arms, your weak knees, make level paths for your feet and for those that are following you, so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed, so that others that are trying to follow in the steps of you, and as you follow in the steps of Christ, that they not only would come to know Jesus, but it'd be able to live victorious lives for him. And it's like a, us as a church, I hope that you'll join us praying that, man, that may, we might be a church that would give spiritual birth or be a place where people grow in the Lord to the point that, man, the next Billy Graham's dad and mom go here, you know, that they don't even know it, but that they become inspired enough that the children that they have become inspired so much that they become great messengers for God. And I hope that you have that in the back of your mind. And again, as a church, that you're not just coming and feeling like, well, I did my duty again. I showed up, but rather instead that you're coming because it's like, God, what have you got for me today? What have you got for me to do? What have you got for me to learn? How do you want to use this life of mine? Because I'll tell you what, folks, for 36 years, my life's not been boring. But it was because 
I'm looking at from that eternal life standpoint. I'm looking at from that standpoint of, God, if you can use me, then I want to be used. And some of you are far greater uh, vessels to be used than what I am. And so then we read in verse 14. So make every effort to live in peace. That's easy for you to say. Yeah. But he, notice he doesn't stop there. He said, with what? All men. Not just the ones you like. But with all men. And to be holy. Without holiness, uh, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God. And that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See to it that no one, or see that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, you know that when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. He could bring about no change of mind, so even though he sought that blessing with tears. And we'll stop there, and as we look at this paragraph tonight, I just ask that you join me in understanding that, man, this phrase doesn't come up real often in our scriptures. But when it does, it gets my attention. Because I don't know how much more you can say it than to make every effort. That means do all that you can do, be all that you can be. It's every kind of commercial or advertisement for the army or the military or something or a marine that you could come up with. It's saying that make every effort. Don't let anything get in your way. Don't let anything stop your mental progress as well as your spiritual walk that will follow that. Don't let anything get in the way between you and Jesus being able to see him, the author and the perfecter of your faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. So as you carry a few crosses in your life, know that you're in good company, right? If you stumble beneath the load, God will have somebody there like he did even for his son. Somebody there will pick up that cross and carry it with you. That's the picture of the victorious Christian. It's not somebody that's breezing through life and everything goes their way. It's rather instead it's an individual that nothing seems to be going right, but nothing will stop them because they know what they have in mind. My heart broke when I remember watching uh, various war movies like Saving Private Ryan and seeing some of these battles that go forth or some of the most recent ones, even our guys over there in Afghanistan and Iraq. My heart breaks when I see those soldiers putting their life on the line. And yet we would dare to sing the song Onward, Christian Soldiers. Before you ever sing that again, and I know that some of you would like to sing it here and we don't sing it here. At least I don't know if we have in the last 10 years or not. But, but I remember growing up hearing it. But I never saw any soldiers going anywhere that were Christians. Because it's like this song that we sing. We're like the children, or like the uh, David's brothers that were out there every morning, every night for 40 days, went out morning and night chanting the war cry, singing the war song. Going to go out, but then they would turn around and run like scaredy cats back to the camp when Goliath would come out and challenge them. It was a stalemate back and forth till David shows up. And all David could see was this big Goliath of a guy. But on all he could see was that this guy was daring to curse his God that was greater than anything. And so David's like, why can't we? Let's go. And his brothers tried to put him down for it. And that's one of the sad things about it. And I think that's why we've got to strengthen ourselves is that sometimes the people that will pull you down will be your own family, will be your own church. Because sometimes it's the person that is on fire that's making the smoke that it irritates others because they want you just to conform. It's kind of like in our country today where they just want you to conform and just accept. Don't think about anything. Just trust us. I'm sorry, I don't. I can look and see what trust has done. And I'm afraid we've stayed silent too long. But I'm more afraid of what we are as a church than I am as a country. Because, you see, we've got a reason to live and to live it out loud. And I'm not talking about becoming militant. I'm just talking about it's militant compared to the Christians that have just decided to make life nice and easy and charge it to Jesus. And I'm not saying that your life has to be hard. I'm saying your life as a Christian will be dull and boring and difficult unless you're actively involved. Then it becomes exciting and exhilarating. I'd rather lay down at night exhausted from doing something for God than be laying down at night exhausted because I didn't do anything except for me. There's a difference with the way you sleep. And I want you to know that difference if you don't already. If you do already, nobody needs to preach it to you, right? But he says, make every effort. Make every effort. I was sharing that uh, uh, the leadership has asked me to do a few little spot type things. And they're, they're kind of like commercials, but they're not. And you'll hear more about it on Sunday. But I was sharing with uh, Joel today, and I told him that, uh, you know, one of the things in the midst of that that I remember learning early on in my Christianity was I used to think that you could talk a church into doing stuff and found out that I was fooling myself. It's like herding cats sometimes, you know. It's not very easy to do. 
and you look pretty stupid riding a horse trying to herd cats anyway. But anyway, the, the whole picture there was, I said, but you know, you see Christians, and, and whether it's that you want them to learn how to witness, or you want them to learn how to give and to trust God with their faith in that way, and how to serve, or how to, to be encouragers, different things like that. And I said, I used to think that it was about preaching more about those things, and Finally, I came down to the conclusion that, no, it's about, you know, if you aren't a giver and you don't witness naturally, if you aren't an encourager and you're not a server, man, I don't need to tell you how to do those things usually. I just need to get you to spend more time with Jesus. Because if you spend time with Jesus, you can't help but do those things that are of him. I mean, he didn't have to go try. It was in his nature. And the new nature that we've been given in Christ allows us then that freedom to rejoice in all things, to be eternally satisfied as what the Beatitudes said, that we can bless this he who and fill in the blank. And most of those things weren't things that the world even desires. But he's saying, man, I'm telling you, you'll be blessed if you do. That's the same one that's inspiring these words to be written here tonight that say, make every effort to live. Now, I know it goes on, but I'm telling you that right now, there are those that are in their Christian life that may be alive and even have had a second birth, but it's nothing like when you're alive, you've had that second birth, and you're living for God. So it says, make every effort. And tonight, I mean, I want to ask each of you, I wish I could interview you personally and say, what do you think about that? Are you making every effort to live in Christ? How's it going? Tell me about your stories. Tell me about the exciting things that are going on, how you're seeing how God can use adversity to bring about blessings. Mackie tonight, Mackie McGreevy uh, just did her wedding about three months ago on Memorial Day. And it was her mother-in-law that just passed away. And uh, she told me tonight, she said that uh, it's so strange. She goes, I just know that it gives me chills because this was the weekend that we originally thought we'd get married. Labor Day weekend. And I told mom, I just felt inside, I said, you know, I didn't feel anything bad was going to happen. I had no idea of this, but I just thought that with Nick leaving to go overseas, that I knew in December he'd be deployed and thought, we need to have that time together. We've already had a long distance relationship through his basic training and various other things, but I thought we need to have our life together, our marriage to get started, so that if we're countries apart and oceans apart, that we'll be together. So I pushed that we would do it, and Lynn told me herself that uh, it felt very rushed at the time because she wanted to be able to put everything in place, but Mackie was insistent. And Mackie didn't take the credit for it other than just the fact that God, she looked at God and said, he did this. She said, can you imagine if we just set that up for this weekend and the mother of my husband-to-be dies the weekend before we're to have get married? Versus the way it was, she got to be there, and her boys meant everything to her. And so she saw both of her sons married within weeks of each other. But uh, she said, I'm not taking and faulting God. I'm just looking and said, God was really good to us, but this hurts. And that's the part that I think is important that we live out. Because I think we have the tendency to say, one of these days, I'm going to start having my devotional life. One of these days, I'm going to start praying more. One of these days, when I retire, I'm going to do this for God. And all I'm saying is, why are you going to wait for one of those days? Because today could be a day. And it could be the best day of your life. Make every effort to live. And then from there, to live in peace. And this idea of peace, again, can't come about in our lives without the Prince of Peace, who is Jesus. I believe the Holy Spirit brings in and accelerates that peace in our life if we're not looking to be satisfied by the things of the world, but rather instead by God. The peace that is unbelievable for me that I can lay my head down at night and if I die, I'm not afraid. I don't want to say I stare death in the face, no big deal to me. It's not that at all. It's that I just am not afraid because I don't believe God will take me out until it's time for me to leave. And if it is, I don't want to stick around. Not because I don't love you, like you, or whatever, but I hope that my death will finally make some of you believe if you don't already. But this idea of living at peace, there is a peace that comes from knowing Christ, and there is a peace even in the midst of the greatest adversity. There's the peace that Jesus had on that cross. There's the peace that he had when he came back to those that were his. There was the peace that we looked at the last two Sunday mornings as he spoke to it. Didn't he have to yell at it? Can you imagine that? As he spoke, as I wonder sometimes if Jesus, to the wind and the waves and that squall that was going on, just said, peace, be still. 
You see, I don't think you have to shout everything for God to hear you or for the devil to flee from you. I think that the whisper of God is enough. But that peace is there. And what this is saying is that you and I play a role in this. That even though that there is a peace that we receive from God that comes with our salvation, that is with the indwelling Holy Spirit in our life, that there still is a peace that we have to search for and reach out for. And it comes about when we learn to live in it, to live in peace. Now, because the devil knows that that's what God's design is for us, that we wouldn't be living in paranoia, we wouldn't live in panic all the time, but rather in this peace, that it has nothing to do with being powerful from the standpoint of the world, but it oftentimes comes about in weakness, but that this peace that would be in us would go ahead and not only be within us, but would be extended to others. It would be so strong that we have an extra cup full to give to whoever asks. That's the picture of this, to live at peace with all men. It doesn't mean that everybody will like you. It doesn't mean that everybody will celebrate you, that will talk good about you. It doesn't mean that everybody that lives across the street from you is going to be perfectly suited. It doesn't mean any of that. It means that you have this inner capability and this possibility to go ahead and because of the power of God that rests upon you to now be able to live at peace with that person, meaning that they don't terrorize you or keep you up at night. They may be your enemy. They may be somebody that for whatever reason seem to have an in for you. And man, I'll tell you what, that is one of the most difficult passages for me to live out. I can live for God when it comes to living in peace with all men. Oh, it's been a hard thing to learn. And I fear even as I preach about that, that I've got more to learn, but I would rather learn it from God than to presume it. But this peacefulness, and I know that in a lot of ways, it's a whole lot easier to be at peace with people. You just stay out of their way, right? I mean, I know what it's like to be married, and I know that there have been those times that I just looked and thought, this isn't worth it. And I'm not talking about the marriage. I'm just talking about tonight's not the night to talk. You just better be quiet. It's not worth it. It's not the time to, well, did you ever think about it this way? And that's nothing against Julie because there's same times, I'm sure there's the same thing with times with me too. I mean, there just are those weird feelings that sometimes you get and it's just like, whoa, I don't think I want to walk on these eggshells, you know? And so you kind of just walk away. Where are you going? You know, and it's like, I just didn't want to fight, you know? But there are things that happen that way, right? Because there's times that there's situations, it's like what I talked about a month and a half ago about, did you ever wake up in the morning and go, I want to be in a bad mood today? How'd you get there then? And it's because there's a lot of people go around in bad moods. And I don't think they want to. They just don't even know what's happened. Because the boogity boogity man came over, overwhelmed them, you know, and it just got all over them. And they don't even know how to shake him off. And so this living at peace is, first of all, it's going to happen because of you and Jesus. But secondly, then, it's going to be so much you and Christ that Christ is in you that it's his peace that gives you the ability to know how the devil works. And man, that's one of the greatest things you can do. It's a part of what this movie we, most of us or many of us saw last weekend. I encourage you, if you didn't see it, go see it. It's worth it. Don't wait unless you just have zero dollars. Don't wait for it to come out on video or to be a free one, okay? Just go to the movie because he's, this lady sets in place such a perspective of this controversy that goes on with the devil and it's learning the schemes of the enemy. Paul says that someplace. I didn't look it up for tonight, but he said that, you know, we are aware or are not unaware of his schemes, or if I remember correctly, the Greek word methodizo, his schemes or his methods. That the devil lives to try to go ahead and to ruin this peace between you and, you and God, you and Christ, me and Christ. And then the next thing he does, because we're supposed to love God with all of our heart, and it's easier when you're at peace, isn't it? Then the next thing we're supposed to do is love one another like you love yourself. And so the devil even works at that. So you don't even have a self-love at all. You don't even understand that. But yes, we do. But it's a selfish love sometimes. And what he wants us to do is to overcome that and realize that, man, I can love myself, but that doesn't make me feel any better because if I don't have others around me loving, then I must not be very lovable. And it makes me not believe that God loves. But when you've really received from God this love, you're going to be able to love others unlike you ever have before. And it's going to be able to see people, and instead of just seeing them as problem child number one to a hundred, you begin to see it as being this thing of the devil's trying to present them in a way you'll resent them, just like we will God. Because somehow or another, we're going to make it God's fault that so-and-so lives next to us or sleeps in the bed beside us or whatever it may be or that our child became friends with or your sibling, or your, sibling your child wants to marry. Man, there's long time been that weird controversy right between the the new husband and the old mother-in-law deal you know but that doesn't always exist i make fun of it all the time because i get along okay with my 
my mother-in-law. I think. I pretend I do anyway, you know, because what's the use? Live at peace with her, right? Tell her she's cute. Man, that, then she, she knows you're crazy. You know, so that helps. And, but, but this picture of living at peace, I don't want to mispaint it or to present it because it's up to you to paint. I'm just giving you the outlines of it. And the outline of peace is this. It's your choice. You can, I can choose. I've learned that about myself. I can choose who I want to like, right? I mean, it's like you can pick your friends. You can't pick family. If you want, I guess you can pick your friends' nose if you're really good friends, but you can pick your friends. But here we don't have a choice. We got to pick everybody. But it's a choice to choose to be at peace. And it's a choice to see beyond and to ask God for insight too so that you know what to do to pray for them, not against. And it's an amazing thing that when it takes place, then how not only is it beneficial to them, but it becomes beneficial to you because you know that one day this was a part of the race and God put this person in your path and he's not going to let you just run around them because they'll show up in another place and another place. And what he's going to do then is to show you how you can rely upon him to begin to have peace even in a less than desirable situation. And that's miraculous. It's what I do understand that the prisoners of war and that the ones like the, the Jewish people that were entrapped in, or put in those internment camps. It's what I understand as I read some of those writings that that's what those people learned to do was to pray for their guards and to pray for people that they really didn't even like or know, didn't want to know, but they began to pray for them because they believed God had a purpose in this. And it's what allowed them later on then, as Corey Ten Boom, to have reconciliation with somebody that had mistreated his or her sister. And that's what you and I can do. Or we can go ahead and allow, and that's where the devil is huge in my head at times, he can allow it to boil up and to, to, to grow, to snowball in our minds, and we can begin to think of how we're either going to get even or we're going to feel like a real hero if we just at least avoid them. Or, boy, we're ready for the deal. We got our gun loaded to tell them what we think about them if we're ever given the chance, right? If they just do that one more time, I'm going to let them have it. That's not living at peace or in peace. That's living where the devil's got more of you than you've got of yourself. And Jesus wants it all. Bring it all. And so we need to share with him and we need to have insight to him and we need to understand that I think one of these days he's going to explain, Steve, look, I put this person in your life. And I could go back through and analyze, but I mean, it's just so cool at this point in time. For me, I don't even feel led to tell you about any characters because I would hate for somebody from one of those previous churches to think I was talking about them. But it's been phenomenal to watch the things that weren't peaceful the first meeting or the first time or even the last time I saw and to watch how God changes things when he, I let him keep working and tuning my heart even as he does theirs. I've had enemies, arch enemies that I've seen after you know, a period of time of two years to 20 years that all of a sudden they see you and they smile and they come up and hug. I had several of those a year ago when I was back that came up to me and just said, I want to apologize for anything that I ever said. And the coolest part was is to be able to tell them that I don't know what you said, and I probably don't want you to hear, but we're cool already. I know, but you need to know I'm sorry. I mean, that's when God's working, folks. That's when it is Lake Placid, when it's just completely a sea of glass. And aren't lakes pretty when it's that way? I mean, there's just something serene about it, you know, and it's just almost unheard of, and you don't want anybody to even touch the water. And occasionally, then one of those fish that some of you guys like to catch will jump up out of the water and the ripple, but even those still down pretty quick. And that's the way it is with God. If you and I are willing to put our peace in him and receive the peace from him, there will eventually be peace. But what he said here was, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. And I don't find it ironic that he links right there with it then after talking about the peace and to be what? Holy. Now, once again, I want to remind you. I don't believe that I have as a human being a capacity of that kind of peace or the ability to make every effort and to be peaceful with everybody. I also don't believe I have within me and my personal ability as a human being to be holy. But I do receive peace from Christ and if I've got a holiness, it's from the Lord. And guess what this is saying? 
but it's up to you and me to put that into gear, just like the peace. It's up to us to go ahead and to take what we've received from Christ and to plant it, so to speak, to let the rubber meet the road, so to speak, to go ahead and to take it out of theory and put it into practice. Because you see, there's no such thing. I really would have to beg to tell you, I don't believe that it's possible to be holy and not peaceful. Because they're both attributes of Jesus Christ. And if one of these or both of these are missing in your life, don't take comfort in the fact, well, at least I'm holy. You might not be. But what you need to do is to look at and say, Lord, I obviously need to spend more time with you because my peace is lacking greatly. And if it is, I probably don't even have a true perspective to understand my holiness. What do you think? How do you know if you're holy? I know that the things that most preachers and myself included would try to describe about holiness. It's got this much difference between being genuine and being legalistic. It's kind of like humility. About the time you get humility, you tell somebody about it and you just lost what you gained, right? It's really difficult to tell somebody how humble you are. But when you're humiliated, it's not hard to tell because they can see it all over you. But these are both things, this living at peace and being holy, we're to make every effort to do. And I really do believe with all my heart that both of them are written from a perspective that drives us into the arms of Jesus to say, Lord, I can't. And he goes, now you're learning. It's just like the law. The whole law was given so that we would begin to understand how utterly sinful we really are. But not so we'd stay in that misery, but rather instead so we would look and go, oh, how bad I need a Savior. And Jesus going, that's me, that's me, come on. And the same way with this, when we read this and it says in the New Testament, not an Old Testament passage, but a New Testament, live at peace, make every effort, do everything you can to live at peace with people and to be holy. And if you're big enough that you can say, I got that one down, what's next, Lord? But for me, it's that I can't. How do I do this? Come spend more time with me. And the kind of time that it takes to do that has to be this, God, I take you at your word. You said that I should do this, so with your power and your spirit, I can live up to this. But on my own, I can't. I can only give you a fake imitation of it. I can only do it while you're looking, but it won't give me peace to sleep at night. And so if you're terrorized, Something that's missing is this closeness to Christ and it's this fabulous belief in his love that will never, ever fail. And I know we know that. And I know, like I said a couple weeks ago, Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. But do you really know that love to the point that you realize that he sees you without sin because of the blood of Christ? But now what he wants to do is to take the rest of your life and to fully redeem it too so that you become a useful tool of his to be able to help others with their weak knees and that they have this unstable or disabled bodies that they can begin to believe they too can grow because sin has affected and disabled us all. I may still be crippled to a large degree, but I'm better off than I was because of what Jesus Christ has been able to do. I couldn't at one point in time even walk with God, and now I can. But I'm nowhere arrived at the same time. I know one thing, I'm not quitting now. Nor am I ready to retire and say, oh, I've won all the people I need. Now I'm going to spend the rest of my life living for myself. Several people have picked up on earlier in the year, they were on the springtime when I was talking about Burnside and the home and about the cornfields and all that crud, you know, and thought I was ready to move back. No, man, winter still happens. I'm not ready to move back. But, but no, I mean, it's one of those things, there's a part of me I could. There's a part of Julie that would love to go back to Illinois to be close to her family. And she'd even move back to be close to mine because it's closer to her family. Probably the only way I'd move back is to be closer to my family than hers. No, outside of that, I hope they're listening to that. Uh, but but the, the whole picture, no. I'm not ready to retire yet. I'm not ready to go ahead and, all right, I gave my life to Christ, and I've got my 37 years in, so it's time for me to quit. I want enough souls. No, man, I want to spend the rest of my life doing whatever I can for the Lord. And I can't imagine just going and living a comfortable, peaceful life where there are no riots and everything like that in Burnside. 
or the biggest thing that we've got up there are raccoons and deer, you know? Skunk every once in a while. Mosquitoes that are a lot bigger than the ones down here. But outside of that, there's nothing going on back there. I want to live for God because I've kind of got this appetite now that I thirst for him. And I don't share that as a woo-hoo and look at me. I share that instead as you can too. To where God isn't boring and isn't one of these, oh, I have to do that as well. No, it's really about just living with Christ to the point every place you recognize a weakness, he's willing to be your strength. And if you're willing to live up to his word, he's willing to equip you to do so. But if you look at a passage like this one and say, it's not up to me to live at peace with all people and I'm holy enough, then folks, I'm just saying that's your choice, your call, but I wouldn't recommend it because that is pride speaking then. And there's a stronghold in your mind. Just like when we won't forgive, there's a stronghold that 2 Corinthians 10 talks about, a stronghold of your mind. The devil's got your mindset or your attitude so locked into justifying how you feel about somebody or something or about the way your life is unfair that you won't even look at a passage like this and say, God, that's what I want to be. I don't know how I'll ever do it, but please, with your strength, let's start tonight. I want to live at peace with all men. And God, I certainly want to be holy because without holiness, your word says, I'll never see you or I can't see you. Now, there's been debate over what that means. I pretty much take it at English straight value. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. I could just go on, right? Probably be smart if I did. But I want to tell you, the part that at least I've learned in this life or on this world and the life on my world in this flesh is that my lack of holiness certainly kept me from seeing Jesus Christ a lot of the times that he was there. Last I read, his promise was, I will never leave or, or leave you hanging, you know, forsake. But man, how many times have you thought, where are you, Lord? Is there any possibility, just in a little bit of if A equals B and B equals C, that A equals C? That if you're not seeing Jesus, it might be because you never got close enough to Christ to let his peace and his holiness be in you and of you and be what you're all about. I mean, because it is so natural for us to be selfish. I want God to save me from hell and I want God to give me a nice life and I want God to help me to just, just stay clear of anybody that I don't like. That's so natural. But it's the flesh and it's the part of the world that's going to be destroyed. But what's unnatural is for us to say, Lord, I just want to know you and you know whatever it will take to get to know you well enough that when I get there, you're not going to say, get away from me. I never knew you. That's the most haunting passage that Jesus ever spoke, in my opinion. Get away from me. I never knew you. Because he knows everybody inside and out. He made us. But what he's saying is you never took the time to get to know me. And so I want to encourage you, just a short verse here. Am I making too much of it? Maybe for some of you, but there's a part of me that I feel like, man, for as long as it took me to get this through my thick skull, it might, some of you might have a nearly as thick as mine. And there's a part that you've got to play because if you're sitting there waiting for it, it's not going to come. It's up to us to live at peace and make the efforts. It's up to us to go ahead and to become more holy. Not because I can do it because I try hard. No, it's making that effort to spend that time with Christ to where his holiness is invades me and so when i sweat that it's his holy sweat that comes out of me and i'm not trying to be gross or cute or anything but that's what would eventually happen that you become so filled with christ that man that's what oozes from you and that's where i know i've still got room to fill me up lord because sometimes when somebody bumps into me i don't spill out peace and holiness how about you you can tell that jesus told us a long time ago that the mouth speaks when what's in the heart? It's a dipper that goes down in the heart, and when the mouth throws it out, it's because it was in there. And it, my heart's not been purified to the point that I never say anything wrong or disgruntled, but it's better than it used to be. I think even Julie would tell you that. And so he goes from there after making every effort to live in peace and to be holy. And, I, man, did I spend enough time on that? Without holiness, you won't see the Lord? I did good. Because, man, I'll tell you what, there's nothing like going through life and seeing the hand of God. Just like Mackie was saying. Through tears, yeah, because she loved her mother-in-law. 
And her mother-in-law loved her because she didn't have any daughters. And finally, she had two now, one for each son. And she enjoyed her daughters. But she was at least able to see the hand of God in the midst of this tragedy. And she believes that God's not done yet. There's something about seeing God that is great. It's sad that sometimes it has to be the perfect sunset or the just right beach or whatever vacation package that you have in your mind where paradise is. Because what's really cool is when you see him in the midst of darkness. When you see the light. When really by the naked human eye there is none. But you know that the Lord's there. Or when it's one of those things that you just did something and it's suddenly it's like, wow, God, that could have been disastrous. That was a bonehead move, you know. And you see God. I think that comes because you begin to spend enough time with him. You, you do believe. You don't have to tell yourself, I know Jesus loves me. No, you know he does. And I've got enough evidence in my past, not from the good stuff I did, but when he loved me and the bad stuff, that I'm convinced. And it is worth it. Now, this next part doesn't break out just because it's a new verse. It is the way they punctuated things, but it all flows together. And it kind of carries that same theme when it says, see to it. I don't know about you, but when my dad said that, that means you better pay attention. Anybody else? Look, boy, I'm telling you, he didn't do that so much, but that was what this meant. See to it. I mean, it was sometimes him and mom would be leaving, you know, as we got older, they would take off and maybe try to do a date night or something. Now, see to it when I get back home, the house is in good a shape as it is when we left. That means if we're going to do what we want to do, we're going to have to clean up a lot, aren't we? <laughs> no, that's not what he meant, right? So see to it here is, is one of those phrases that we have that you know what it means. It means don't take this lightly. But it also implies it's one of those you understood statements. It's about you. It's about me. Steve, see to it. Julie, see to it. John, see to it. Kevin, see to it. Each of us should put our own name in front of it because that's what it is. It's a you understood statement. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Now, this is the part that I probably did overload the first part because it flows right along with that making every effort. It's about that, but it's also about the idea of living at peace with all men and women and kids, all right? Because if we don't do that, the next thing that's going to happen then is we will have trouble being holy and we will have trouble seeing the grace of God. We'll miss it. And the grace of God is, is certainly in the first place would be in salvation. It's who God is. He's gracious. Uh, charis is the Greek word for grace. It's, it's, it's very much akin to even Christ, who I know meant the anointed, but it's, it, the, the Christos and Charis are really co kissing cousins, so to speak. And so Jesus is grace and gracious. Uh, many of you know that one of my favorite passages in the book of Jonah, chapter 4, and it occurs three or four different times in the Old Testament that uh, I knew, Jonah's saying in a wrong way, I knew that you were gracious and compassionate and slow to anger and abounding in love. The reason I've memorized that is because my mind and sometimes my experiences don't feel that way and I have to realign my mind with the truth of God. You are gracious. Meaning that gracious is another name for God. You are compassionate. His name is compassionate. You're full of grace and full of compassion. You're full of love, abounding in love. And the other thing that he says, and you relent from sending calamity. You don't like it when things don't run smooth. Paul wrote about that and said that, you know, the devil is the devil of chaos, confusion. God's the one of peace and of order. See to it that no one misses the grace of God. So it would be God himself. It would also be salvation. The other part of the grace of God is what he extends to us, as we've covered multiple times, as you've heard me preach before, in 2 Corinthians 12, where Paul pleaded, take away this thorn from me three times, I pleaded, and God said, my what is sufficient? My grace. So when we have a weakness, Paul learned to celebrate his weaknesses, the insults, his hardships, remember all the other stuff? Learned to embrace them and said, all right, from now on, then I will embrace them because when I'm weak, that's when I'm really strong because his grace is sufficient. So when he says, see to it that no one misses the grace of God, it's kind of a double play. It's like, first of all, are you saved? Yes, I'm saved. I know that. I've got the grace of God. And then Paul's saying, well, does the rest of your life reflect that? 
the part of you that has so filled with the grace of God that you are gracious to others, living at peace with them, being holy to them, even when they're unholy to you, is it there? But not only that, but this grace of God that also then would not only extend out that way, but then that would bring a peace to your soul. And that's this picture. Don't miss the grace of God. He's there to make up the difference between you and the, the objection of others. And you find that grace, at least for me, I mine that grace out sometimes by praying and having to change my mind and say, God, right now, I want to pray for him, all right? It's like the person that wants to bury the hatchet in somebody's forehead. You know, I mean, they go bury the hatchet, but that's not what my dad meant when he said bury the hatchet, right? It's supposed to be take out of your hand and you just go put it in the ground because there shouldn't be any quarreling even going on here. But again, it's your responsibility and mine. We are the only ones that can see to it that we don't miss the grace of God in our lives and our lives extended towards others. And sometimes it's even the grace that happens when I found out that there are some people that God did put in my life because I may not have liked them, but I needed them. Nothing against Julie, but there's even been a time when that was a the case there. If you ask her and she's honest, she'll tell you about a thousand times that that was the way she felt. She didn't like me, but she loved me anyway. You know? But that's where it is. The grace of God is there because he knows what we need. We only think we know what we want. And I've seen a lot of people that even when they had everything they wanted, still lacked a lot and weren't at peace. But notice what happens then if we don't see the grace of God, experience the grace of God, extend the grace of God. Bitter roots start to grow up. This is probably one of the most untapped passages in the Bible, at least my experience as a minister. I mean, the first three churches I was in, uh, in the first 20 years, everything that kept them from growing was a direct result of bitterness. I mean, they believed in Jesus. They just didn't believe that they needed to change anything or let Jesus change anything in them. And it's what happens. It's the, it's the religious people that put Christ on the cross. And so these bitter roots grow up because of either somebody I don't like and I'm going to prove to everybody else what's wrong with them and what's right with me. And they have the people on their side that do the same and it suddenly becomes the aisle, becomes as wide as the Red Sea that the Israelites went through on. Or it's this resentment that builds in there and it's a bitter root that even when they change churches, they still have it against each other. And it's a spirit that will stay with the church. One of the greatest little booklets, and it's the best kind of booklets to read, those are about 40 pages long, but is the uh, one called The Accuser of the Brethren. And it's just so bizarre. I know I've mentioned it before, but I would encourage every one of you to go online and read it. It says, and I... I love this because I hate it, but it's so true that in a church, that the way the devil works is that either right after a breakthrough, and a breakthrough in a church is when finally, suddenly it's like, man, we, we don't clear the air by getting rid of everybody, but you clear the air by suddenly just letting Jesus be the focus of it. That shortly after a time like that, when you feel the grace of God is being poured on, out upon a church, that it's not unlikely for the devil to send a fault-finding spirit or a critical spirit. I think he calls it a fault-finding demon and a critical spirit upon the believers. And that what begins to take place then is that they turn from each or turn from God and turn on each other. And it's why the quip that I had on the sign there the time before about the idea there's a big difference between praying P R E Y upon or for each other versus praying P R A Y for each other. And there is, right? whole difference and so this picture of this bitter root is what happens and as it grows it causes trouble and defiles many i'd go so far as to say if we backed it up to verse 13 that it's one of the things that makes paths unequal or uneven and difficult to run upon it's hard or it goes back to chapter 12 verse 1 and 2 there where it says throw off everything that hinders Man, bitterness is much heavier than you'd ever imagined it's kissing cousins with bitterness and hatred and resentment, right? And I've told most of you that one of my favorite sayings that Tony Hartman ever taught me was that resentment is that poison pill that you swallow while you're waiting for the other guy to die. And it get you first every time. 
So what do we do? Because we've all had offenses, things that people have done against us, right? I mean, is there anybody here so squeaky clean that nobody's ever said anything against you, you know? We've all had people that didn't follow through with what they said they would do, that we heard talk behind our back and that, or did something straight to our face even. So what do we do? Well, the only way that I know of with roots like this is to what? Pull it out by the roots. That's the way you kill the weed so it doesn't grow back. Some of you have been through far greater things than I have been. Some of you can listen to Joyce Meyer and understand. She had plenty of things to resent with her dad sexually abusing her, her mom letting it go on and on and on the different things that she mentions. And she had to fight through and work out the bitterness. But she suddenly realized that that's what being a Christian was all about, was letting go of my rights and letting his grace fill in the gaps. We're at a time when I need to shut down here so that we can share communion together. So as we do, if you would, go over to the book of Corinthians, if you will, please. And I want you to see something over here. It's about the Last Supper, or the Lord's Supper. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And 1 Corinthians, I had written down here several times that I was going to bring things out of tonight because it is a book that does talk a lot about weaknesses and uh, brings up other things and how God even chose the weak of this world to shame the strong. And I think that's good news for any of us that feel weak at times, that God loves that the Jewish people were from a man way too old to have kids and a woman that couldn't and was certainly too old to have them by the time that 25 years rolled around. But God still began his race his nation with them but here in first corinthians 11 verse 17 in the following directives paul's writing this to a church the church at corinth he said i have no praise for you ouch and there were some of them didn't like the things that paul said and that's why they wrote a letter back to him and he had to write second corinthians back to them but he said in the following directives i have no praise for you for your meetings do more harm than good in the first place i hear that when you come together as a church there are divisions among you and to some extent, he said, I believe that. You, know, you hear that all the time. He I believe that. Like, not in a good way. It's like, whoa. No doubt there have to be, and this is a parenthetical statement, I think. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. In other words, it's kind of tongue-in-cheek sarcasm there that Paul's saying. It's the fact that, yeah, there's differences because you won't lay them aside. You know that you're right and you're better than somebody else because look at me in my life and my spiritual giftedness is one of the things that Chris the Corinth had. So it's not a good thing to know that you have the approval of God and you're looking down your nose at somebody else that doesn't. Not exactly the spirit of Christ, okay? He said when you come together in verse 20, it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat. Oh. Wow. We called it that, Lord? No. Paul's saying, for as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. Now, some think that that means that every church ought to hold the cup and the bread, and we wait, and they take it in unison. And I've done that a few times, and I love and enjoy doing it, but I just think it's more appropriate to give each person that chance when they're ready to take, but you can't just pass it out and wait for everybody to raise their hand when they're ready, you know? But it's not that. They were actually having an agape feast. But notice what he says. He said, when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper, because as each of for as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. If you take the word waiting instead of it being this stopping and being patient and tapping your toe, but you look upon it as another word that we have, it's we eat at restaurants, we have waiters or wait staff. Um, nobody's waiting on anybody else. Nobody was considering anybody else. It's just, it's all about me. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Man, is that bizarre? That's another good reason to use Welch's instead of the, the hot stuff, you know? But uh, they were going on and eating, and even to the point of instead of waiting for the rest of the crowd to arrive, they just start eating. They go, oh, man, there's plenty here for us. We weren't thinking about who else might show up. Paul says, don't you have homes to eat in or drink in, or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those that have nothing? The whole point of this being is, is this is all about consideration. It's about not just doing religious things in a religious way. It's about stopping and it's examining yourself. 
And that's what he goes on to say. Is saying, search me, O God, and see if there's an offensive way in me. It's about, God, I don't want to be presumptuous here. I believe I know you and I'm right with you, but how's it look to you? And how does it look to you through me the way I treat and serve others or wait upon them? He said, man, you got your own home you can do that in. Or do you despise the church of God? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. He said, for I received from the Lord what I passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. You individually and you all, I believe. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink drink it in remembrance of me. So whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you're actually proclaiming the Lord's death till he comes. Praise Jesus for dying. We're telling the world till Jesus comes back. He died for me. And how can you say, he died for me, and then still live for yourself? The only proper response is what? I'll live for you until I die, right? Till death do us part. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. I don't want to do that, do you? So verse 28, a man ought to examine himself before he eats. And it wouldn't hurt you ladies too as well. Uh, but, you know, sorry, that was a little tongue in cheek. Before he eats the bread and drinks the cup. So you ought to examine yourself. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. You don't think that's a big deal? Read this next verse. That's why many among you are weak and sick. And a number of you have fallen asleep. Not sleeping in church. They were dead. Now, I don't know what that means, and there's been great debate over it. Does it mean that they'd fallen back into a spiritually dead spot? Or does it mean God literally just took their life because he said, man, I'm not going to let you contaminate the body? It's, I think, impossible to be able to say because Paul often used the term fallen asleep to be those that died in the Lord. But I think it's a part of judgment. What do you think? And that's why James then kind of backs it up, or Paul backs James up, because he said, if you're sick, call the elders, and after you've confessed, have them anoint you, you know? So you can sin, and you can be forgiven, and not only forgiven, but healed. And I'm not saying that as a hold it over your head. I'm not insinuating on anybody. I'm just saying, that's why for me, when I do get a cold or something, the first thing I ask God is, is something I'm doing? Because I don't want to be presumptuous unless I presume, all right, I screw up a lot, God, so just tell me if this is what I've done wrong here. And it's not just because I don't want to be sick. It's more than that. I don't want to get that sick, and I don't want to presume myself. I would rather be open before God, right? And know that at least if I'm suffering, whether it's with an illness or whatever, that I'm suffering for Jesus and not because of the way that I've neglected Jesus. So tonight we're going to take communion. And I don't say that so that all of you go, I'll pass tonight, I'll pass, I'll pass. But examine yourself, okay? And the greatest thing about doing that is, it's the prodigal son. That's what he did when he was feeding the pigs. He examined himself. And he thought, man, what have I done with my life? My dad's servants live better than this. I don't deserve to be his son, but I'm just going to go back and ask dad for a job. And when he returned, what happened? Open arms, ran to meet him. So that's what communion's supposed to be. It's not by taking this, I get rid of my sin. It's by examining ourselves and saying, Lord, I want all of you in all of me. Father and God, might you lead our hearts tonight and Lord, might we continue to ponder both these verses and the ones there in Hebrews. Man, if you said in your word, make every effort, God, I mean, that sounds like don't just try swing and a miss and I'm done. Keep swinging. Keep striving. And God, not alone, but with you and toward you and for you. Because Lord, certainly anybody like you that would die for me, you'll do everything you can to help me live for you. And I pray for that grace in my life, but also for every one of my brothers and sisters tonight that are here. That God, that man, we would have fruitful, productive lives. 
and that we would begin to not let the devil, because we're aware of his schemes, not slow us down by throwing somebody that's disgruntled into our path. And Lord, not running over them, but praying for them and seeing what we can do to nurture them. But Lord, help us to release and to give it all to you. Tonight, in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.